So we've made it to the kingdom that uh, perhaps you're the most familiar with, the kingdom Animalia, into which we fall. Um, we're going to talk about the animals, we're going to talk about our, um, our origins, what makes us an animal, um, our phylogenetic tree, where do we fit uh, in the big picture, how are we organized, how do our systematics work. So let's get right into it. As far as animals go, where do we come from? Well, we descended from multicellular colonial flagellates, which were protists. Um, protists, as you know, they, they are at the root of all of the eukarya. All right? they, they, um, they spawn the, the plants, the animals, and the fungi. So we're no different in that respect. We came from the protists um, and, and specifically from multicellular colonial flagellates. What makes us an animal? Well, for the most part, animals follow these rules. All right. Uh, I would have put that, that we are heterotrophic, but there are lots of organisms that aren't animals that are also heterotrophic. All right, fungi are heterotrophic, but, but fungi um, digest their food outside their body and then they absorb it. Protists, some of them are heterotrophic. We specifically, we ingest our food, all right? So we, we take our food into our body and we digest it inside the body. Uh, as far as structural support goes, we don't use cellulose or chitin. We don't have cell walls. We, we use proteins such as collagen and keratin for our structural support. So that sets us apart from plants, from fungi. Uh, we possess nerves and muscles, um, so true tissue. You're going to see that when we go through our phylogeny that there are animals that don't have true tissue, um, kind of our outgroup that we start with. We have particular embryological development patterns that set us apart from one another, and it's one of the homologies that we use in order to classify ourselves. And finally, we are multicellular. There aren't any unicellular animals. Now, it's important as we're going through the cladogram that you uh, commit to memory somehow the thresholds of divergence. So why are things diverging uh, and becoming different phyla? Uh, what homologies are we going to use? Well, I've listed them here. Okay, Early on, uh, we diverge based on whether or not we have true tissue. Uh, then we use the idea of symmetry uh, compounded at that particular branch in our phylogenetic tree. We also look at uh, the idea of whether or not we are diploblastic versus triploblastic. We're going to explain what those things mean. Do we have a coelom? Uh, are we pseudocoelomates? Um, are we protostomes or deuterostomes? And finally, do we have secondary radiosymmetry? This might seem like a lot of jargon now, but moving into this phylogenetic tree, well, here it is. Um, hopefully it makes more sense as we finish this up. So this is kind of a rudimentary um, phylogenetic tree that I, that I put together for this. Uh, which sense is red? Okay. Um, this, is, this is Animalia, and you know uh, from our cladogram and our, our phylogenetic tree screencast that this first branch is our outgroup, all right? And in this case, it's going to be that uh, phylum within Animalia that doesn't maybe fit as well as, as the others do. And we're talking about the periphera, all right? The periphera. And the periphera, oops, I knew that didn't look right. That should be an E, B R I F E R A. The periphera are the sponges. All right? The sponges belong down here and they branch off here because they don't have true tissue. They don't have muscle cells, they don't have nerve cells. So we branch them off here. So that means that anything from here and beyond, we're looking at true tissue. All right. Now, down at the base, remember, we've got the multicellular uh, colonial flagellated protists. So we're moving up, moving forward. We have the protists, uh, no true tissue, no muscles, no nerves. Now we have it. Once again, we diverge. So no tissue. The second divergence, we're dealing with symmetry. So if, uh, if the organism branches, up, branches off this way, that means that the organism has radial symmetry. Now, what does radial symmetry mean? Radial symmetry means that the organism is fairly circular. Radial symmetry means that uh, if you look at the, the organism's body plan, 
that if you lay it out in front of you, um, there are multiple planes at which you could slice the thing in half, kind of morbid, but you could cut it in half, you could draw uh, an imaginary line down the middle, and it's going to be the same on both sides. You could do it this way, you could do it this way. Okay, they're kind of circular in shape. They have radial symmetry. If the organism continues on this way, we're talking about an organism that's bilaterally symmetric. Bilateral symmetry. Think about us. We don't fulfill this. All right? We're not radially symmetric. There's only one plane down, down which we can be cut. This one. And we're the same on either side. So we are bilaterally symmetric. What organisms are radially symmetric? We're talking about the cnidarians. Cnidaria. Cnidaria, those are the, um, they have stinging cells. So we're talking about jellyfish, sea anemones. And the tenophora. C-T-E-N-O-P-H-O-R-A. Kind of stretch for room here, so I'm not riding as smoothly as I'd like to. These are small, they're ciliated um, aquatic organisms. Um, very simple. Now, at this branch, not only are we, are we dealing with a divergence in symmetry, but we're also dealing with a divergence in embryological development. Okay, We're dealing with uh, different uh, tissue levels. The organisms that are radially symmetric are also what we call diploblastic. They are diploblastic. Now notice this prefix di. That's going to come in to be pretty important. These are diploblastic. These organisms that continue on are triploblastic. I want to explore this a little bit further. Diploblastic has to do with, and triploblastic has to do with the the, the layers of tissue. So if this is the innermost layer of tissue with a cavity on the inside, there's a layer of tissue on top of it, and the cells are dividing here. Here are the cells. Obviously they're not rectangular in shape, but this diploblastic organism, this embryo of the diploblastic organism, has two tissue layers, two cell layers. Thus, the dye, diploblastic. Okay, so you can probably guess that a triploblastic organism, starting with the prefix tri, has three germ layers. Okay, I'm just signifying the cells here. is our middle layer and our outer layer. Tri triploblastic. This innermost layer in both cases, this is called the endoderm. All right, here we've got innermost, outermost. We have the ecto derm and these have completely different um, roles later on in this embryo's um, development but here once again endoderm on the inside ectoderm on the inside we have an extra layer here in the middle meso meaning middle the mesoderm the mesoderm is going to come up again right when I switch back to the next uh, the, the, the previous slide the mesoderm is involved in this next piece of divergence, all right, this next threshold that we're coming up to. Um, organisms that branch off here are called acelomates because they don't have a coelome. These do have one. They are coelomates. What's a coelome? Well, if you think about our body structure. The inside of our body, we, we encapsulate our organs. We kind of have like a bag on the inside of our body in which all of our organs are. That bag or that cavity is our coelome, our internal body cavity. Um, if you don't have one, you're an acelomate. If you do, you're a coelomate. Now, the mesoderm 
as we saw here. That's what turns into your coelom. Okay, the mesoderm, the coelom is mesodermal in origin, so the mesoderm becomes the coelom. The acelomates, coelomates continue on. What are acelomates? Well, the flatworms, platy helminthes. I don't know how many these are the flatworms. They are acelomates. We continue on with the coelomates. So we have some semblance of a coelomate until we get here and we reach the pseudo coelomates. So they have kind of a coelom. Pseudo coelomates. So they have enough of a coelom that they're not acelomates, but not enough of a coelom to continue on. They're pseudo coelomates. All right, and here we're talking about rotifera, which are the plankton, and nematoda, which are the round worms, round unsegmented worms. Okay, so we are we have a coelom. We're continuing on. We get up to here, and now we are going more embryology. Okay down here, diploblastic versus triploblastic, all about the, how the embryo uh, is developing. More into embryological development patterns here. If you branch off this way, these organisms are deemed protostomes. If you keep this way, you are a deuterostome. What does that mean? Let's go back to our, our drawing board here. Protostome, deuterostome. All organisms, as they begin to develop, are a big ball of cells called a, called a blastula. Okay, and this ball of cells continues to divide by mitosis and develop. And as it gets to a certain stage of development, a pore or a hole forms in it. So. Let's say this is the hole, okay, and that hole is called a blastopore. It's a pore in the blastula. Organisms that are protostomes, this first pore, this blastopore, is going to become the mouth. The blastopore is going to develop into the mouth. Mouth first, protostome, mouth first. Deuterostome. This blastopore is not going to develop into the mouth. It's going to develop into the opposite of the mouth, which is the anus. Okay, Protost protostome mouth first, deuterostome anus first. So here are our protostomes going and coming up this way. When we're looking up here, we're talking about the bryozoa. Okay, uh, the bryozoa are aquatic invertebrates. Uh, they're called moss, the moss animals. So kind of boring as you could probably imagine. Um, we're going to skip a couple of these. I don't need you to know every single one of them, um, but this particular branch is the Brachiopoda. Brachiopoda? Apoda? Okay. They're the lamp shells. They have two shells. They'll open up so that they can feed. Moving on, more protostomes. We've got the mollusks. Mollusca. This is a U, in case you can't tell. The mollusks are the bivalves, um, the gastropods, the snails, the cephalopods, which are like the squid. Okay. We have the annelids, annelida, which are the segmented worms, like night crawlers, earthworms. Um, we have the arthropods, arthropoda. The arthropods are the crustaceans, the arachnids, insects, um, centipedes, millipedes, etc. Okay, moving on, almost done here. Deuter deuterostomes. Okay, remember the the blastopore turns into the anus. We've got echinodermata. We have the echinoderms. Echinodermata. I know that's not very well written. I apologize. And us. The chordates, echinodermata. Now, if you're a, a thinking biologist, you might be thinking right now, well, the echinoderms, those are the sea urchins, the sea stars, the sand dollars. Those, uh, those have radial symmetry, right? 
shouldn't they be here? Shouldn't they be up here with the Cnidarians and the Tenophorans? Well, remember, this was a dual divergence. We had symmetry. We also had whether or not they were diploblastic or triploblastic. This kind of trumps the idea of symmetry. The fact that these are triploblastic is extremely important, okay? And it means that we need to have them over here with the rest of these organisms that are triploblastic. They evolved um, radial symmetry secondarily. Okay, it came back in, in, in their phylogeny. And the chordates, obviously, we know about us with our notochord, um, with our post uh, with our with the tail that does not have a hole at the end of it, um, that we have gill slits at, at some point uh, during our development, and all that. So this is a, the, the, the huge picture of, of animal phylogeny, how we fit together. It's important that you remember these points of divergence. How are we split up? How are we classified? Because it tells really, really a lot about our development um, and our relatedness as well.